Welcome back. Uh, the next panel we have uh, in our Rogue Prosecutor series uh, here from Los Angeles uh, is a distinguished panel of deputy district attorneys who are or were uh, prosecutors, career prosecutors in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. And uh, let me introduce uh, you to them. Uh, to my immediate left is uh, Jonathan Hatami. Uh, John is a 16-year veteran prosecutor of the L.A. County DA's office, and he's currently assigned to the Complex Child Abuse Unit as a senior trial attorney. He has handled thousands of child physical and sexual abuse cases and has prosecuted over 70 felony jury trials, including the four-month trial of the torture and murder of Gabriel Fernandez. He is featured in the six-part Netflix true crime documentary, the Trials of Gabriel Fernandez, released in 2020. I've watched it. It's terrific. I hope everyone checks it out. To his left is Kathleen, or Kate. Uh, Katie uh, is a victim's rights attorney for the Dordulian Law Group here in Los Angeles. <clears throat> she provides pro bono representation to crime victims and assists them with asserting their rights in criminal and juvenile justice cases. She was a deputy district attorney in the LADs DA's office for over 30 years, from 1989 to 2019, where she held leadership positions in the Victim Impact Program, the Bureau of Victim Services, and prosecuted hundreds of cases, including high visibility homicide, sexual assault, child abuse, and other complex cases. She's a board member of the National Crime Victim Law Institute, the Children's Advocacy Centers of California, served on the California Children's Justice Act Task Force, <clears throat> and has received numerous awards throughout her storied career. To date, she has filed over 100 lawsuits against George Gascone for violating victims' rights. And Eric Sadal, to her left, is Vice President of the Los Angeles Association of Deputy District Attorneys and is an L.A. County DA as well. He is also cross-designated as a special assistant United States attorney for the Central District of California. He is assigned to the Crimes Against Peace Officers Division. His past assignments include prosecuting gang homicides, domestic violence and sex crimes, including crimes against children. He has tried over 80 jury trials. He has written extensively on California's criminal justice system and issues. He has trained prosecutors and police officers throughout programs directed by the L.A. County District Attorney's Office, the Los Angeles Police Department, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, and the United States Department of Justice. So as you can see, we have an incredibly talented group of people, and I want to thank each of you for coming here uh, to help us in our Rogue Prosecutor Series. Appreciate it. Thank you for thank having you so us. Much. <clears throat> so I think it's probably helpful to just start with some basics here. You work in the biggest DA office in the country. Uh, there's, what, a 1,000 attorneys, Eric, in your office? So right now there's about 850 uh, deputy DAs. We, we Normally we're at about 1,000, 1,100, but because of attrition, uh, it's down to about 850. And you're spread out throughout the whole county. Right. So it's the largest county, the largest district attorney's office, probably the, lo the largest local prosecu uh, prosecutorial agency in the world. And so is there, I know the answer to this, but for our viewers, is there just one office where you're all housed or are you housed throughout the county? No, we're housed in, I mean, it's a, a very diverse county. Um, you know, from the north of, uh, in Lancaster to the south in uh, Long Beach and Compton, we have some of the wealthiest, some of the poorest neighborhoods in, in the United States. So you have not only sort of mini DA offices <clears throat> around the county, but you also have courthouses around the county. Is that right? That's right. But you're all part of the DA's office. We're all part of the DA's office. There's one district attorney for Los Angeles. We represent 10 million uh, residents throughout the entire county. And you've been in that office for coming on 20 years. Um, well, 15 years for me. 15 years. Yeah. Um, Why did you become a DA? I became a DA because it's the best job in the world. You get to do the right thing at every time. Um, there were cases where I did not believe in, and I was able to dismiss those cases. Um, 
we get to do justice in the courtroom. We get to protect people who were not protected on the streets. And uh, our primary mission as a, prosecu uh, as a prosecution agency and as prosecutors is always to do justice and the right thing. So it's the best job, it's the easiest job in the world until September of 2020. We'll get to that. So, Kathy, you've seen a lot of change in the office. Um, when you joined the office back in 89, how big was it? Well, it certainly was uh, smaller than it is now. I don't know that I have the actual numbers, but I, I do know that, um, of course, we didn't have as many um, residents in L.A. County, uh, definitely not as many prosecutors in L.A. In LA County. Um, there weren't as many units, <coughs> um, you know, so things definitely have grown, you know, as crime has um, become more sophisticated, you need to make sure that you respond in a way um, where you're able to have prosecutors who um, have experience and expertise in how to handle those kinds of cases. So that deals with, you know, child abuse cases, um, it deals with domestic violence cases, it deals with uh, gang cases, um, any, you know, any number of types of cases. And you were in the office when the nationwide crime spike really rich, reached its peak in the early 90s. Uh, and you sort of saw it go down precipitously. Uh, and when you finished uh, your career uh, in 2019, it was at one of the lower levels it's been throughout your career. That's right. And, um, I mean, that certainly was, uh, I, I remember when I first started in the office, I uh, was in, uh, you know, as Eric said, there's offices all over. So I uh, was in the Pomona office, and uh, there were a number of uh, gang homicides that were going on. I mean, like, incredible numbers. And, uh, of course, for every one of those cases, you have families that have been devastated by crime. So, um, thankfully, uh, the crime went, crime rate went down. And uh, when I retired, as you said, it was definitely better than it certainly is now. And uh, with crime rates up again, of course, victims uh, and their families uh, really feel the impact more than anybody. Now, one of the um, arguments, the progressive or what we call the rogue prosecutor movement is they call people like you guys and me, uh, carceral people, uh, lock them up and throw away the key types, uh, non-reform minded. I suspect there were reforms and reforming going on for your entire 30 year career when you were in the DA's office, weren't there? Um, I would say yes. You know, uh, whenever you're doing something, you always want to make sure that you're doing it in the way that is um, best, most effective, um, and that is the fairest um, to everyone involved. So um, I would say absolutely. Uh, throughout my career, there were um, you know, times that people would um, always try to make things better. Um, I certainly recognize that uh, there are many people who uh, <clears throat> probably should not be uh, in custody and do deserve uh, to get a second chance in a program. But when you uh, are talking about people who commit uh, horrific crimes of violence, um, and uh, you know, when you look at their past history, which is, of course, the best indication of what the future will be. Um, you want to make sure that you are protecting society um, from any acts of future violence that those people do. And um, that uh, I feel very strongly that uh, when people have shown that they are not able to uh, behave well in society and they continue to seriously harm others, we need to make sure that they're not um, in a position where they can continue to do so. John, what I admired about you when I first met you is the guy I saw on the Netflix special and the guy I met on FaceTime and the guy I've met in person, you're just the same person. Um, why DA? I'm sure you could have done other things out of law school. And that's a really good question, Cully. Um, I'm not, um, I guess, the type of prosecutor that it was my lifelong dream to become a prosecutor. I think many prosecutors in our office, either they always wanted to do that or they clerked for the office. Um, really for me, what I wanted to do is do something to help children, to help abused and neglected children. And I think I found a home in the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office, and I agree with, with uh, what both Kathy said and what Eric said. Um, I think it is, or it was, uh, the best job that I've ever had uh, until George Gascon took office. 
uh, in December 2020. Um, but I became a prosecutor because I really wanted to help children. I wanted to help abused and neglected children. I wanted to get up and fight for them. And I found a home in the district attorney's office. I found a place where I could do that. And so um, I'm grateful uh, to not only the office, but to God <coughs> that uh, I'm able to do something that I believe that I was put here to do. And you've been open that this is personal. You know, I think it goes both ways. One, um, I took an oath to fight for the children in my cases. And I also took an oath to all uh, the Angelinos here in Los Angeles that if I was assigned a case that I was gonna fight for that case. And so when George Gascon took office and he instituted these policies, what he was saying to me and all the district attorneys is that you're no longer allowed to fight for your case. You're no longer allowed to consider the evidence you're no longer allowed to consider the law, and here's my dictates of what you're going to do, and you need to go do it. And I don't care about the evidence in the case, and I also don't care about the family members uh, who are <coughs> impacted by that. And so yes, for me, um, one, it, it is very personal. Um, I am a person, and I, so, so I hope everybody sees things as, as being personal, but I take my job and what I'm assigned to do is very, very important, and that I think the community wants me to consider that as being important. And so, yeah, when he asked me and all the other district attorneys to do something that was just, I mean, it goes against anything I believe in, and it goes against why I became a prosecutor. And so, yeah, it, it, it became very personal. Well, let, let's dig into that, because I think, you know, especially folks on the East Coast, um, I mean, we all watch Law and Order. We all watch cop shows. Uh, uh, but people on the East Coast who know anything about DA offices, our our way of doing things back East uh, and a lot of places in the country is people like you guys, you're at-will employees. Uh, so if you don't do what the boss tells you, you're out. Uh, but <coughs> you have the privilege of working for a county where you're a protected civil servant. So you're protected under the civil service laws, much like people are in the federal government. Uh, and so, among other things, you have a DA's association, Eric. And the DA's association, for lack of a better term, is sort of a union, right? A collective bargaining unit right. uh, that uh, gets to get together and sort out, you know, things like pay, benefits, pension, work conditions, the typical things that an association would. You all took a very extraordinary step. Tell us about the step to sue George Gascone and where that is. Okay, so one of the things that first happened when George Gascone took office was he implemented a series of directives. It's just another word for orders. Some of those orders were contrary to California state law. Uh, what, uh, and I'll give you one. And we're going to go through all of them, but right. you know, give us the big picture. So there's one in particular that was very much in, against, uh, there was two in, in particular that were against California state law. One of them was he ordered us to dismiss any type of special allegations or enhancements at the first hearing. And for those who do not know what a special allegation or enhancement is, it basically is a way of appropriately punishing people for certain type of conduct. For example, if you rob someone and you don't use a weapon, you are charged with just simple robbery. But if you use a gun, the law recognizes, the state legislature recognizes, the voters of California recognize that that conduct is very different. So what we have in California are called enhancements. And that means we add special allegations to our charges to appropriately punish people for different types of behavior. For example, and I gave the gun example. Gascon doesn't believe in enhancements. So he told all of our prosecutors to dismiss enhancements at, their, at, the, uh, at the first court hearing. Well, in order to dismiss something that has already been charged, we have an ethical duty and a legal duty to have a reason to do that because the United States and California are 
It's a nation of laws. It's a state of law. And it's not just one man dictates what he believes in. And we have a separation of powers. And we have a separation of powers. And the DA's office sits in the executive branch of the government, so you don't make the laws, you enforce the law. Right. But there's also something that happens when we charge something. The judiciary now gets involved. So it becomes also a, a question of judicial power. Well, he said, you know what? I don't care about that. I don't care about the law. I don't care about the judiciary. I don't care about your ethics. I don't care about what's good for society. Go and dismiss all of these enhancements. And that put our uh, DAs, our deputy DAs, in the unenviable position of saying, do we follow his orders? And that's all it was, is an order. Or do we follow the law? And do we follow our ethics? And Jonathan was just being nice. When he said it's a request, it wasn't a request. It was a order from on high. It was a direct order. Yeah. And so what we did was, and this is, I think, the first time this has ever happened in American history, is we uh, went to a judge and said, hey, judge, the DA is not following the law. You need to put a stop to it, and you need to issue an injunction. And the judge did exactly that. He issued it an injunction. And basically what the judge ordered was, Mr. District Attorney, you must follow the law. You don't, you're not above the law. You can't violate the law. And I want to, I think that's, it's important for your viewers to understand like how ridiculous this is. That we have to go to a judge and say, judge, would you tell the guy who's supposed to be enforcing the law to actually enforce the law? Because he's breaking the law right now. So uh, we successfully got this injunction. Um, and now the DA has to, you know, in the, in the cases that were filed under the previous administration, under Jackie Lacey's administration, he can't just dismiss something just because of his personal views. And he also is forced to enforce the three strikes law uh, which, again, was passed by voters, in fact, was repassed by voters in 2012, and has consistently passed with approval ratings of about 70% of the voters of the state of California. So, uh, you know, the man came in with an ideology, it, not based in law, but based in his warped view that he needed to ter- overturn the entire criminal justice system, One man was going to basically undo decades and decades of law, decades and decades of judicial decisions. One man. And the judge stopped that. So you guys took the bold move to sue your own boss. A judge agreed with your all side. Right. Obviously, that creates a very tense office environment. You weren't there. You were probably thinking... Glad I'm not in that office anymore, <laughs> right? Um, let's, you and I have talked before this, and I want to sort of uh, demonstrate for folks through a case, an actual case, uh, this um, order to not use enhancements or allegations. Um, in March 1st, 2019, uh, Trinity was brutally beaten to death, tortured, and dumped dead on the side of the road. Uh, her mom and a man named Emile Lamar Hunt were charged in Trinity's murder. The problem was for Hunt that he had a criminal record. In 2005, he physically abused his three-year-old son so bad that the kid had to be put on life support, Mm -hmm. and Hunt was convicted of that crime and got 12 years for that. Uh, Of course, then he... um, uh, did another crime. Uh, what does the law require prosecutors to do in a case where you have a guy like Hunt with a prior conviction in the new case, Kathy? Sure. So um, California law uh, requires, like Eric was saying, that uh, when someone has a prior crime like that, that they must, uh, that prior has to be a- alleged. As so written a, down on a piece of paper right, on an indictment. <clears throat> right. So you're charged with murder and it's further alleged that um, you have this prior strike conviction and um, it's a prior strike and a prior five-year prior. So um, 
Hunt was charged with that. And um, as and you said- And charged with the enhancement, right? Correct. So um, what that meant is that um, Trinity's mom, uh, who was involved in her murder, um, of course, is looking at a count of murder. But the boyfriend, who has that horrific record, was looking at murder plus this allegation that he had the prior um, history. And that has a really important effect. It will um, change what his... Um, sentence could potentially be down the road. It can change his bail. Um, <clears throat> but unfortunately, because of Gascon's uh, mandates, um, the prosecutor in that case had to go into court and say to the judge, um, based on what I've been ordered to do, um, I'm asking you, judge, to dismiss this prior uh, conviction that Hunt has. And so um, pretend the previous horrible physical assault of this kid never happened. Correct. And treat the mom and the boyfriend who has this horrible record essentially the same. Mm -hmm. So um, that that would be that is the effect. So um, the judge, based on the prosecutor going in and making this motion, and to be very clear, she um, said, "I'm being ordered to do this, but judge, just so you know, there's no real legitimate reason for me to make this motion. It's not, you know, there's no legal reason, there's no factual reason for you to go ahead and dismiss this, but I'm being ordered to do that, so I'm coming in and asking for you to dismiss it. So what the an judge, position oh, to it's put a horrible a deputy position. DA in. So um, the judge, uh, unfortunately, did grant that motion to dismiss. So then what occurred is, um, as Eric was saying, um, a judge granted an injunction. So two months later, right, this order to all the prosecutors to go in and dismiss all these allegations was in effect for two months. So a lot of damage was done in those two months. And uh, Trinity's case, unfortunately, was one of those cases where the, the prior strike was dismissed. So when um, the judge told Gascon, okay, essentially you've broken the law and you have to stop breaking the law. Um, Gascon, instead of saying, oh, my bad, um, he didn't do that. He doubled down. And what he told prosecutors was, okay, so from now on, you have to follow the law. But if anything was dismissed over these last two months, based on my directive and not based on anything else, um, you prosecutors are forbidden to go back into court and to ask the judge to reinstate what was dismissed without any legal justification. So the prosecutor, again, was not allowed to go into court to ask the judge to reinstate that conviction. So um, as it stands now, um, the two defendants um, essentially are being treated exactly the same. And um, the, the ridiculousness of this position is if the prosecutor's office actually dismissed the murder case right now and immediately refiled it, they would be able to add that strike conviction back. In fact, the law requires that they would add it back. But because <coughs> of Gascon and his orders, the prosecutor you, you know, is not allowed to try to get that strike conviction. Uh, conviction back in. So um, that's just one of thousands of examples of injustices that happened during those first two months when Gascon uh, first became DA. John, you have been uh, very thoughtful and very vocal uh, in the media about your deep concerns about the negative impact these directives have had uh, once they were issued. Um, your protected civil servant, you, unlike a lot of people, have stepped up to the microphone and, and talked about this. When these directives came down, and I'm going to um, tick off some of them, uh, the 20-TAC-14 resentencing directive, which is probably going to affect 20 to 30,000 people yeah. who were justly convicted, but once they've served 15 years or more of a sentence, you guys are required to walk down the hall, talk to the public defender, and make a motion to let these dudes out of jail, the fact that most misdemeanors are just dropped. You can't even file misdemeanors. Uh, juveniles can't be tried in adult court no matter what they do. The pretrial release policy, which is a, a fluffy, happy term for basically not asking anyone to be held prior to trial, no matter what bad things they've done. Uh, he has a basically Fox in the Hen House unit that he created, the habeas corpus unit, uh, to uh, unwind other convictions that your office rightfully earned. 
Uh, he's not allowing the death penalty. And the list goes on and on. Um, just talk to us about what you want to talk about here. I mean, because there's so many things we could touch on, but I th I'm sure that there's a few, especially given the caseload, the kind of caseload that you have. Um, you have some things that you want to sort of get off your chest and sort of explain. I would say, uh, first, Cully, I think even though we have civil service, and, and Eric can attest to this as well, it is scary to step up in the public and go against the elected DA. Um, one, I've never seen that happen uh, in my 16 years in the office. And once you do that, it, it becomes, you know you have, basically, you know, you have now put a marker on yourself and, you know, you feel like you're gonna be a target. And so I think that it was difficult um, <coughs> coming forward um, at first because I was really scared. And I think at the end of the day, I just knew that no matter what George was saying, I was just going to do the right thing. And he said some very disparaging things about you, such that you actually sued him personally. He did. So what happened was, is a week after those directives were issued, um, he ordered me through my chain of command on one specific case, the first case I had under his, I guess you can say his reign as the DA, um, to remove certain strike allegations and to remove some enhancements. And I struggled with that. And he had a, he had a script that we had to read, um, which makes no <laughs> right, sense. Right, in court. Which makes no sense as a <laughs> right. prosecutor because one, we base things on yeah. evidence and on the law. And so we don't go into court and read scripts. It's just not, you know, we, we file charges based upon the evidence and based upon the law and based upon it being able to prove something beyond a reasonable doubt. Right. I've read these scripts. I mean, they're, they're out there in the public now. You, you basically stand up in front of a judge. Your Honor, I'm required by the eighth floor of the DA's office to dismiss the following enhancements in the following case. Right? Like a robot. Exactly. Even though the law requires it. And Did anyone in your office worry about losing their bar ticket? Because, I mean, you have ethical obligations under the bar, don't you? I mean, you do. We do. So do. that was a, there was a lot of, you know, before anything was going on, before the media, before the recall, before any of this, the prosecutors, we were all dealing with this. And there was a lot of things being talked about. We, how can we go do this? How can this happen? How could, how could, you know... And part of it is George Gascon has never prosecuted one single case. He's never walked into court and done anything as, as a lawyer. And so he just believes... He's the DA in the largest DA's office in the world, essentially, and he's never prosecuted a DWI or a theft? Not a misdemeanor. He's, he's never even gone into court and argued well, as a Well, I, I just want to correct John on one point. He has come into court, but it's usually because he's being sued. Exactly. Oh, oh okay. Exactly. So he's been a yes. defendant or a part yes. of a, yes. a, a party, yes. a party to a case. Yeah. And so um, he. I mean, just... it, we can't. We shouldn't laugh at this because <laughs> this is dead serious. Yeah. It really is. Uh, you, uh, like my wife, have handled horrendous child abuse cases. Tell us about, like Kathy has, and I want to get to the gang dropping the gang hardcore gang unit with you, Eric, because you served in the gang unit for a long time. Tell people the impact of this, these dictates, the cumulative impact of these dictates on dropping allegations and enhancements um, on your child abuse caseload. They're huge. First off, you're dealing with family members uh, of these children who are depending on you as the prosecutor and our office to fight for that child, to be the voice for that child. And when you file these cases, you get assigned the case, you roll out with the police department, you, you look at the evidence, you attend the autopsy, you meet with the family, um, you put the case together, you file the case. It's called vertical prosecution. And vertical so, meaning uh, you own it from cradle to grave. Exactly. You roll out to the crime scene to the point when the jury returns their verdict and you sentence them. And when George Gascon said start erasing basically charges, allegations, and enhancements that have been proven by the law and the evidence, it affected a lot of individuals. And so a lot of my cases, 
Uh, two cases I had, I uh, had already gone to the death penalty committee. The death penalty was taken off the table on those cases. I had cases where he wanted me to re remove the special allegation. I refused to do that. I had cases where he wanted me to remove the strikes. I refused to do that. I had another case where Pro Fernandez filed a motion to be resentenced. Um, and on his uh, special directive, it indicates is if, if you are charged and convicted of a special circumstance, you're supposed to submit and, and not fight to make sure that, that that person doesn't stay in custody for a life without the possibility of parole sentence. Uh, and I decided that, no, I wasn't going to listen to many of those uh, directives. And, and there, have, there are directives that affect everything. Uh, they affect bail. They, they affect charging. They affect enhancements. There's a little boy named Anthony Avalos, and you're holding that case right there. Yeah. That's a case that um, I handled from, from, from the beginning. As a 10-year-old uh, boy who uh, was murdered. Tortured, uh, according to all the evidence that was presented in the grand jury, and I can talk about that, was tortured repeatedly and murdered. Uh, we had over 60 witnesses testify in the grand jury, thousands of pieces of evidence, um, that case was investigated thoroughly. Uh, we presented that case to the death penalty committee, which is a very thorough committee. Um, we rarely, and Eric and Kathy can both contest to this, we rarely seek the death penalty in Los Angeles. It is very, very rare, and it's cases where I believe we have 100% evidence. Solid cases where the evidence isn't the issue. The issue is really what the punishment right. is. And the, the, these family members went through this entire case, went through the issues with the death penalty committee, and, and you know, were depending on this case and, and what was going to happen. And having to walk into court uh, and tell the judge, basically, I don't agree with George Gascon. I don't agree with his policy. I'm not going to get rid of the special uh, allegation in this case. However, Your Honor, the, the, the George Gascon says he doesn't believe in the death penalty, even though uh, it passed in 2012 and again in 2016. By, and by statewide referendum. <clears throat> even though I had already filed um, um, uh, a, a motion indicating all the reasons uh, why this was a capital punishment case and all the uh, aggravating factors that we were going to present and, and having to walk into court and seeing the entire family there and having to change that. Um, it's huge. It, 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 you're talking about a family that already lost a child through some horrific facts, and now they have to relive all of that, and they feel that the office and the DA is just letting them down. And that's a, that's a hard thing for us as prosecutors to have to deal with in court. And it's real life. That's, that's the thing that really people need to understand. George Gascon can care less about you, about me, about families, about Angelinos. He can care less about children. He doesn't care. He, he completely lacks empathy. And what I tell people is I'm not a law and order prosecutor. Now, I'm going to tell you this. Everybody who's a prosecutor should follow the law. I'm a compassionate prosecutor because I believe in people and I believe in fighting for people. And George Gascon's narrative is he thinks he is the one fighting for people, and he's not. He's not fighting for any of us. W one of the things I said, I, I asked the sheriff, and I want to get your reaction. And I've met just you two tonight uh, in person. I met John tonight for the first time. So we don't really know each other that well, but I certainly respect uh, your dedicated service and your career as deputy DAs. Um, what, one of the things Zach and I have been saying all along is when we started researching and writing about this rogue prosecutor movement two years ago is this isn't about Democrat or Republican or left or right or conservative or liberal. This is really about law and order and chaos. Are we wrong, Eric? No, I think that's exactly right. And I think, you know, look. When he ran for DA, when he first ran for DA, the first thing he said was, I'm going to turn the whole system upside down. And he allied himself with people who do not believe in prisons, uh, who uh, believe that the police are, and this is their quote, not mine, are trained to kill them. Um, they do not believe in anything 
about the American justice system. In fact, they won't even use the word justice when they're talking about the system. They'll call it the legal, the criminal legal system. So their whole effort and Gascon's whole effort is to just eliminate everything that we've done. He has falsely said that the past 40 years have not made us safer, even though if you look at the data since 1994 until about 2017, there has been a continuous decrease in crime. In fact... And incarceration and serious crimes. Well, actually, what's interesting about incarceration is that incarceration rates actually started... um, The rate of increase decreased from 1994. Uh, That's a little known fact. The numbers ballooned because we made... We uh, increased the sentences... But in terms of the rate of increase, because we were making things safer, because we were making, we were lowering crime, we were actually able to lower the amount of people that were going into the prison system. So uh, we were, you know, basically the whole thing was we, we were on the right track. We were saving people's lives. You know, a great study was done by a Princeton sociologist and because of the rates, of the decrease in the rate of homicide between 1994 and I believe 2014, the life expectancy of African American men went up by 0.8 years. That's a tremendous health benefit. So we were making amazing progress in terms of bringing peace to neighborhoods that were experiencing you know, just a, just a pandemic of violence. And, you know, I think that is one of the things that is so often lost in this debate about, you know, what you call rogue prosecutors, I'll call them reckless prosecutors, is that this supposed reform is really devastating uh, the most marginalized communities, especially communities of color. Yeah, in fact, as we've been making the rounds here in L.A. County in the last few days, <clears throat> we've been talking to politicians, city council members, law enforcement folks. And the point we keep hearing over and over, and Kathy, I'll be curious to hear your reaction to this, is um, when they're letting these people out of prison early uh, or not sending them there in the first place or letting them get these freebies, uh, where do you think they're coming back to? They're coming back. They're not going to Hollywood. They're not going to the swanky parts of town. They're coming back to our communities, and they're destroying our communities. So this notion that, you know, they're doing this to help black and brown and minority people is actually the opposite because it's negatively impacting that. You think they're on the right track? Um, I I do, Um, and I, uh, I completely agree with you. This is not partisan or political. This is really, this is a community safety issue, and it has to do with recognizing that there are people who are dangerous and trying to make sure that we keep them off of the streets. So um, I, and the number, um, you know, over the last year, I've, I've had the honor and privilege of representing um, over 100 murder victims' families. And um, what I hear from them over and over again is, first of all, that they do feel completely abandoned by uh, Gascon. Mm-hmm. And um, they're devastated and completely re-traumatized. Of course, it was bad enough, you know, to go through the murder of someone that they loved, right? That was traumatizing enough. But when they feel that um, the district attorney has abandoned them, that's a re-trauma that occurs. So they've been re-traumatized by him. And many, many of the people that um, I've had the honor and privilege to know are from very disadvantaged communities. And that is exactly what they say. They say, you know, you, you want to let him out, you want to give him an, a second chance, but he's not going to come and live with you, Gascon. <laughs> he's going to come and live in my neighborhood. And um, I don't want him. <laughs> you know, we, we want to make sure that our children um, have a safe place to live. One of the things a law enforcement officer told us today, I want to get all of your reactions on this is more of a yes, I agree or don't agree, is he said, um, people who get sent to jail here, not prison, but jail, serve a minuscule amount of time. And you got to do a repetitive number of things to even get sent to jail. So that by the time you actually get sent to state prison, you're a career criminal. You've been doing this stuff a lot in the state of California. It's not like Texas or some of these other states where you make it jacked up and put in prison pretty quickly. To get into Pelican Bay or some of these big 
prisons, you have had a career of crime. Is that your experience? 100%. Kathy? Um, I, I would agree. John? I do too. I agree. I think people need to realize that uh, in California, um, if you're actually going to state prison because of all the propositions that have passed uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, you are a violent individual. Um, you talked about language, Eric, and sort of feel good, poll tested, blather, reimagine prosecution, <laughs> all this stuff. One of his directives, yeah. 20 hyphen 14, the resentencing directive has a footnote. It says, quote, we will seek to avoid using dehumanizing language such as inmate, prisoner, criminal, or offender when referencing incarcerated people. That just struck me as bizarro land. Um, because, you know, if you jaywalk, you're a jaywalker. Mm -hmm. If you speed, and I do, uh, I'm a speeder. If you're a criminal defendant, if you violated a crime, you're arrested, you're a criminal defendant. Are you guys required to blurt out these words when you're in court, or you, can you be normal, like talk like regular prosecutors? You, you mean, are we... Are, like, are there word police in the office now? So there, uh, I think that was one of the things he was trying to do, uh, this like 1984 newspeak language. Um, in fact, uh, I was at the Compton Courthouse uh, at the DA's office, and apparently one of Gascon's minions was going through the DA's office, and he noticed that there were gang maps, and he said, you need to take out the gang maps. And they're like, well, we're the gang division. That's what we prosecute. We prosecute <laughs> gang members. This is in your own office. Yes. And they're like, no, this is offensive. It is offensive. And they were like, well, how do we, you know, we need the maps to show which territory is claimed by which particular gang. And they were, we don't use the word gang in this office. And, you know, he changed the name of our gang unit to the Community Violence Reduction Division. I like it to call, I call it the COVID division because the reduction is silent um, because there is no reduction here. There is no plan here. Um, you know, it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of nonsense. It's a bunch of words, you know, test poll, uh, words that he thinks are going to ingratiate himself with certain segments of society. But it, that's all it is. It's it basically, he is taking a page from 1984, the book, and is now trying to make that within the office. Kathy, you wrote a piece called A Preventable Murder. Mm -hmm. Tell me about 41-year-old Alejandro Garcia and his wife and three kids. So, um... Any murder is horrifically tragic. Um, what's what's perhaps even more tragic about Mr. Garcia's murder is that it really didn't have to happen. Um, Mr. Garcia was working alongside his son at um, Taco Bell, and um, the defendant, uh, a man by the name of Madden, um, came through the drive-through and tried to pass a twenty-dollar counterfeit bill. And um, there was. You know, they were obviously checking the bill. It's counterfeit. We can't take the bill. So he took out a gun and uh, shot, and Mr. Garcia was um, murdered. And this happened on January 8th this year mm -hmm. in South Los Angeles. And Jonathan Madden, the shooter, had a criminal record. He, he had a, a, a horrific criminal record, actually. He'd, he had um, at least two uh, robbery convictions. He had uh, prior... Um, gun allegations he had <clears throat> he'd been to prison um and so we knew what kind of a person um mr madden was well let me read well, about his record real quick just sure. because uh, i know you have so many cases and i want people to understand that this is not just a bad dude yeah this guy had a 2001 felony conviction for robbery he got a second chance and was put on probation he was, got a 2002 burglary and grand theft conviction, a 2006 robbery conviction, a 2009 conviction for possessing drugs while in prison, and a 2018 conviction for felon in possession of ammunition and possessing cocaine for sale. And he had open cases when he murdered 
this poor man at the Taco Bell. Right. So and it was totally preventable. It was, it was preventable because um, a year before the murder, um, a- approximately a year, he was charged with ex-con with a gun. And um, given his record, right, um, first of all, he had strikes. And um, <laughs> we knew he'd been to prison. And um, so when you look at his records, you know that an ex-con with a gun who has the kind of record that he does, he should have stayed in custody. But Gascon's policy doesn't allow for prosecutors to ask for bail on non-serious, non-violent crimes. And, um, so an ex-felon, queer felon, yes. with a gun, yes. is not a violent dude. Under Gascon's weird, weird world. Correct. And so he, um, he bailed out. <clears throat> so he was out for a little bit, and um, then he picked up another case, um, a drug case, and um, sales of cocaine, I think it was. And um, so there's another allegation that really is supposed to be filed. Legally, it's supposed to be filed. So first of all, he has a second case, and he has um, the strikes. But there's another allegation that can be filed. So when you commit a second crime and you already are out on bail on a first crime, you can file this out on bail allegation. And that adds, of course, it can add time, but it also adds bail, and it also alerts the judges um, that this guy has another open case. You know, judges, they, they don't get crystal balls when they become judges. They only know about the person's record based on what is filed in the charging document. So, you know, I'm sure the judge had no idea that he had this other open felony case. So um, on the second open felony case, he was once again allowed to bail out. So he had two open cases, one involving a gun, and of course he had that horrific uh, record, but because of Gascon's policies of not allowing prosecutors to file appropriately uh, and legally charged allegations and also not allowing prosecutors to ask for bail, um, he was out. He never should have been out. He should have been in custody. And had he been in custody, um, Mr. Garcia's wife and his children would still have their husband and their father. Um, and it is directly because of Gascon's policies that um, that murder occurred. And, um, y- you know. I'm not asking for a reaction, but for most people, mm-hmm. they think he's got blood on his hands when yes. he enacts these policies. I yeah. mean, that's just, sorry, but that's what it is. Um, <clears throat> Hannah Tubbs. A lot of us around the country watch the news, um, everything from Squawk Box on CNBC to Fox to CNN to BBC. Of course, a lot of us are watching the Ukraine-Russia thing now, but the Hannah Tubbs case struck a nerve around the country, and this involves Gascon's directive not to um, prosecute juveniles, that's somebody under 18, as adults in adult court, even when they commit adult felonies. Tell us about that. Tell us about the jail calls and the mockery of the system. I mean, you have a somebody who at the time was 17 and brutally molested and assaulted a 10-year-old. And so right This is a guy who digitally penetrated a girl in a was it a public bathroom or somewhere? It was a bathroom in a Denny's. And what you need to realize is and if you handle uh, sexual assault or child sexual assault cases, that was somebody sexually assaulting a stranger. And so right away when you see that, you know you have a major problem. You know right away that person is dangerous, that a 17-year-old walked into uh, a restroom and sexually, brutally, by force, sexually assaulted a 10-year-old stranger. This, that, is, this is a parent's nightmare, right? This is why 100%. Like, like, I, I don't <laughs> let my girls go into the bathroom in the public place. I go to the, like the family bathroom, and that's why a lot of families do this now because they hear about cases like this. Right. Exactly. And so, you know, you, this individual also, about a year prior, brutally sexually assaulted a four-year-old in a library restroom in Kern. That's the county north of here. Yes. That prior was known to George Gascon. He knew about it. Probation knew about it. The court knew about it. This person who uh, was 17 at the time and then 
now is 26, had committed numerous crimes by the time that person turned 26. Uh, inclu- in other states, too. In- including a violent felony, which was a strike in Kern, stabbing someone. And so this individual is dangerous to children, dangerous to all of us. And, and anybody who handles sexual assault cases, uh, domestic violence cases, child abuse cases, knows that the studies clearly show that if you continuously are doing that, you are going to keep doing that. You are going to be a sexual abuser for a long period of time, if not forever. And so that's why in, in the state of California, we're allowed to use their prior, bringing it in in, in, in open cases. George Gascon knew all of that and still allowed this individual to Who eventually handled, was picked up to be handled in juvenile court as a 26 year old. And that person then is, is now being housed in a facility with other females, with juvenile females, by the way. And George Gascon is okay with that, having a 26 year old who molested at least two females to be in a juvenile facility with other kids who are females. In addition to the fact, George Gascon, at least through his administrative team, knew about jail calls where, where this individual mocked everybody and, and he was said, talking to his dad. And said right? yes, and said horrendous things <clears throat> about the victims uh, and about the fact that he was getting over. And George Gascon has the audacity to tell all of us that he would have done something different had he heard those calls. So the first thing anybody could say to him is there was no jail call exception or any exception when George Gascon made that decision to, to adjudicate this 26-year-old in juvenile court. And what it tells you about George Gascon is he will say anything and do anything if the media gets involved. And by the way, any baby DA, and we all were baby DAs <laughs> back in the day, right? You learn about jail calls. Yeah. So if he'd actually been a prosecutor, he would know about jail calls and the the mother load you can hit sometimes when you listen in on those jail calls, those recorded calls. And when you say get over, that's DA lingo. Tell people what get over means. He, he was, be specific. He, he knew, Hannah Tubbs knew exactly that under George Gascon's policies, he was getting just a slap on the wrist six months to two years in a juvenile facility with other female girls um, instead of being tried as an adult and going to prison for a long period of time. Not only that, Hannah Tubbs doesn't have to register as a sex offender. Right. So when you said that it's every parent's nightmare, I'm raising two children in this community. Most of us have children and we're raising them in this community. George Gascon doesn't care about any of those children because if he did, he would make sure that somebody who has violently sexually assaulted two females, children who were strangers, would make sure that that individual not only went to prison, but if he ever got released, he would have to register as a sex offender. So we would all know where he was at so we can all protect our children and our families. Right, and everyone knows, especially you know, people when they move into a neighborhood, they'll go on the NSOPR, the National Sex Offender Registry, type in their zip code, and see who the, where if there's registered sex offenders around them. And it shows you on the map. Because I know the woman who set it up back in the Bush administration and, and upgraded it years later. Um, but Hannah Tubbs or whatever his name is going to be next week, he'll, he won't appear on that. Exactly. And so this George Gascon is an individual who claims to have 30 years of experience as a police officer. Uh, well, ex- he does. Right. Eight, eight, I'm not sure what he was doing. Uh, during those 30 years. So I, that's why I said my wife's a police officer, so I could tell you that she works hard every day. And so I'm not sure what George Gascon was doing as a police officer. I'm, I'm not sure it was much. But he also has eight years experience as the DA of San Francisco and then more years experience uh, as the chief in Mesa, Arizona. And with all of that information and knowledge, he still allowed a serial sexual predator to be adjudicated, a 26-year-old, to be adjudicated in juvenile court without sex registration, without any serious punishment, in a, in a facility with other young females. What does that tell you about him as a person? You know, it, it, it's interesting. we got about five minutes left, and I want to cover a couple things quickly, sort of a lightning rounds here. Um, 
gangs. Gangs were big when you first got in the DA's office. Um, they got really big. In fact, there were TV shows about them. I mean, L.A. has gangs, just like New York has gangs. Boston has a different type of gangs. Uh, the DA's office decades ago set up a gang unit mm -hmm. to liaise with specialty police officers, specialty folks in the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office. There's t there were tons of gangs here. But that unit, and I'm going to use the word gang, because uh, no one's telling me what I can say. Uh, that unit was very successful. Hard job. What did Gascon do to it? So the unit that you're talking about was created in 1978, and it had about, uh, about 50 dedicated prosecutors to it. Uh, one of the first things he did when he came into office is he got rid of the unit. He decimated the amount of uh, prosecutors that were dedicated to combat gang violence from 50 to 25. He got those 25 prosecutors uh, or those, those, uh, those spaces. And what's interesting is you, you began this conversation about resentencing, about the 20 to 30,000 people that he's eyeing to release. So he used the res our resources to combat gang crime, and he put them into the resentencing unit. So basically, he has reversed the, the focus of the office. And I think if you, you really want to uh, you know, know someone's value system, you look at where their, what their budget is and where they spend money on. He went from we went from an office that prosecuted gangs and successfully prosecuted gangs and, and brought peace to a lot of very marginalized neighborhoods to an office that dedicates its resources to releasing violent criminals. Yeah, and that's George Gascon's yeah, DA's it, office. It, it is bizarre, honestly. When I read these directives, and our, when Zach and I have published our pieces, I mean, a lot of people read our stuff, and they almost don't believe it. Right. So that's why we hyperlink to the actual directives. But let me read some of the language from that resentencing directive, which is 20-14. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Accordingly, this office will reevaluate and consider for resentencing people who have already served 15 years in prison. Experts on post-conviction justice recommended that resentencing be allowed for all people, and some experts recommend an earlier date. I don't know who these experts are. We haven't been able to find them. Um, and he keeps talking about excessive. I think they're in the public defender's sentences. office, <laughs> right? And, he, and, and he's brought in a bunch of public defenders, right? People who've never prosecuted a case. And I was I was a criminal defense attorney, yeah. fought like hell, but we have an adversarial system, and the prosecutors are supposed to prosecute. And public defenders are supposed to defend. And I mean, imagine the outcry from the New York Times, or the Washington Post, or the L.A. Times if the public defender is that an appointed position. It's appointed by the it county, is. yeah. Yeah, yes. the county appointed a prosecutor to the public defender's office and then brought in 15 hardcore prosecutors and fired a bunch of public defenders. Oh, my gosh, those papers would be going crazy. Rightfully so. Uh, rightfully so, because we need an adversarial right. system, right? We need hardcore, dedicated, compassionate prosecutors who are ethical and hardcore, compassionate, ethical defense attorneys and let them duke it out between a fair and impartial jury and a detached magistrate and a judge. One of the big talking points that this rogue prosecutor national movement talks about is they have data and science, which I know you've heard in your office, uh, to back up their theories. Uh, and when pressed, they put out a little one-page uh, uh, puffer piece uh, with no real meat to it on what the data and science is. One of the arguments is that and I'm going to try to say this without laughing out loud, if you refuse to prosecute a whole bunch of crimes, especially misdemeanors, you're going to get less crime. I'll say that again. Refusing to prosecute all these crimes that have been passed by the state legislature, signed by the governor, you're going to get less crimes. How has that worked out, John? That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. Uh, I've said that numerous times. It's worked out horribly. Violent crime in our community has skyrocketed. We have a 15-year high in homicides. Grand theft autos are up both in, in the county and the city. Uh, armed robberies are up both in the county and the city. And so anybody 
who claims to be a prosecutor and says to you that I'm not going to prosecute crime and therefore it's going to make our community safer is, 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 is one, lying. Number two is he's involved again in his word salad, which what he does is he, he, he'll just say something and he just hopes that the community will believe it. And, and, and that is just dangerous. Um, so in terms of the resentencing, the one thing that I w wanted to point out is that for each one of those cases, you have victims. And the California Constitution, one of the things that's included in there is that victims have a right to have some finality in sentences, right? You know, you go to court, you get this sentence, and you kind of can relax and think, oh, thank goodness. Okay, well, I can, you know, feel like that's done and over. But um, what Gascon is doing is that he is deliberately then trying to go in and undo sentences that have, you know, given safety to communities. Um, but he's doing so uh, really, again, once again, traumatizing, re-traumatizing crime victims and their families um, by asking them, okay, well, you know, would you be okay if we change the sentence? And, you know, crime victims, it's exhausting being a crime victim. Um, First of all, you, you know, you're just trying to get through every day. Never mind have someone call you and, um, y you know, the people that are making these calls, um, they're not really prosecutors. And, um, and I was with the Bureau of Victim Services for a long time. They're also not the advocates that are uh, with the Bureau of Victim Services. There are other people who are, have come in who use this word salad thing where you can't call people defendants. You call them criminally involved. I, I, I don't know, whatever. Justice they, involved. Yeah, justice involved. I want to make sure you have the right Thank lingo. you, thank you. <laughs> yes. Justice involved individuals. So, um, you know, you have these people making the phone calls to crime victims who are really... Um, they are so upset and re-traumatized by having this come up again when they thought that it was final. And what is happening is that his policies, as Eric said at the very beginning, are violating the law. And when you again look at the Constitution, the Constitution says victims are entitled to finality in sentences so that they can, you know, hopefully try to get some peace and, and move on with their lives. Which and, the Supreme and, Court of the United States has, <clears throat> has reaffirmed over and over and over again. Yeah. Uh, and when Congress passes <clears throat> uh, the Anti-Death Penalty Act, uh, uh, they made sure that people can't file interminable appeals mm -hmm. because justice requires closure at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Eric, what about this data and science, don't prosecute and crime will go down bit? So what he does is he'll get one study He'll misread the study uh, and then say that uh, crime goes down when, when uh, you lower sentences. None of the actual studies will actually say that. In terms of if you actually look at the academic studies, they do not say what he says. No. And in fact, say. we've written about it at Heritage.org. We've looked at the one study from Texas that he cites, and he actually totally misreads it. 100%. He yeah. misreads it 100%. In fact, what's interesting about the study that we're talking about from Texas it actually refers to other studies that directly contradict everything that he says right. about this data and There's science. There's no there, there. Not nothing. There's zero. Yeah. It's, all, it's all made up. And the other thing that he's very good at is he's very good at manipulating our own office statistics. So the data that's coming out of the DA's office is becoming unreliable. So we can't actually rely on what our DA is saying. It, in terms it's interesting of our you day. bring that up because uh, I was talking to one of your colleagues, who I won't mention by name, and asking him or her uh, for closure rates and conviction rates from your office for the past five years over various crimes, including in the Jackie Lacey period through the Gascon era. They have been disappeared from yeah. your website. Right. Yeah, you just erase the data, erase the history, and, you know, a new world order. I thought over. Gascon was Mr. Transparency, John. <laughs> That's it. It's a, it's a complete lack of complete transparency. Lack. He, he constantly ran on this statement that, oh, I'm going to be transparent, and it's an absolute lie. He is the most untransparent district attorney I think we've ever had. Um, and I think now even the media uh, is starting to get frustrated with what he's doing. Um, he hides things. Um, he manipulates the data, like Eric said. He um, launches out information at the end of the day or on a Friday at the end of the day. Um, he, he constantly misrepresents statements. 
Um, he'll put things out in it through Twitter or through Instagram instead of actually verbally talking about it. Um, he, he completely lacks any sense of transparency. You know, one of the um, uh, city council members I had the privilege of meeting when I've been out here is a Democrat. He worked hard to get Obama elected. He's a very reputable young man, uh, good, strong family man, Native American and Mexican. Uh, he said um, the Gascones of the world and those behind him are, quote, ruining the Democratic brand. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a really interesting statement because I know you're a Democrat. Uh, I've never thought of friends as Democrats or Republicans or just friends. Uh, but I, I was really struck by that comment because it seems to me like the pendulum is swinging back a little bit, hopefully. Uh, the recall effort is ongoing. We don't do politics at Heritage. We just do policy. I note that you have more than 200,000 signatures on your way, hopefully, to uh, the magic number over 500,000. Um, I want to give you a chance to close out here. Uh, any thoughts you have to just people who will watch this about um, the real world consequences for the community which you have invested your careers and your families in on these policies and any anything you want to wrap up with? And I'll start with you, Eric, and we'll just come down the line. Well, I you know I think that's that's a great point in terms of the uh, the lack of partisanship on this issue. Um, you know, I know Kathy's a Democrat. I'm also a Democrat. Our board of directors, uh, six out of the seven board of directors for our association are Democrats. I think the office is a very diverse office in terms of race and party affiliation and ideology and everything else. Um, and this, I never thought that public safety was a partisan issue, nor should it ever be a partisan issue. Um, but Gallup it, just came out with a poll saying crime is uh, one, of the, the, one of the number one things on people's minds across Democrat and Republicans across the country right now. Right. And that's because, you know, public safety is the very basic thing that government should do, is it should always provide some type of public safety so that it doesn't matter where, whether you live in Santa Monica or, or or Brentwood, or a wealthier enclave of Los Angeles, or you live in Watts, you know, a more disadvantaged neighborhood in Los Angeles. You should be able to be safe within whatever neighborhood you live in. And I think that is one of the things that is so destructive about this kind of reckless uh, prosecutor that Gascon really exemplifies. I can't get you to say rogue. <laughs> I mean, I. You know, I, I suppose, you, you know, rogue is also an appropriate term, but what I think is, is really the issue is, you know, rogue can be good, right? You could be, so, you know, a, uh, you know. John a, McCain was a maverick, right. right? So. But really what these policies are are completely reckless. They're not studied. They're not thought out. They're illegal. And the people who are going to be paying the price on these issues are people who, you know, who can't afford the price. It's a great point. And that's really what is so unfortunate about what is going on in Los Angeles and this social experiment that he's engaging in. He's engaging in a social experiment with other people's lives. You know, he lives in Naples, which is a, you know, a rather ritzy area of Los Angeles County. You know, there are moats around it. I mean, he's literally protected, right? He has bodyguards. He carries his gun everywhere he goes, including on planes illegally. Um, so, you know, this is a man that is perfectly protected. He doesn't have to worry. He doesn't have to worry about his own safety. He doesn't have to worry about the safety of his children um, because he doesn't live in Florence Firestone that just, you know, saw a 200% increase in their murder rates. He doesn't live in Watts that experienced a 150% increase in their homicide rates. You know, he's insulated, and so are most of his supporters. The people who actually bankroll this man are people who do not ever have to worry about public safety. Kathy? Um, so I, uh, you know, first of all, thank you for having us uh, and for covering this important topic. Um, for the, the uh, what Eric just said, the, the people 
who are really impacted by this are the victims. And the, the victims, time and time again, what they'll say to me is, and they're crying. They're crying. And I'm sure, you know, Eric and John have probably also had victims cry on their shoulders, you know. I, I know that many of my former colleagues have that same experience. But they're crying and they say, why is he doing this? Doesn't he understand? Doesn't he understand that it's it's my life, that it's not fair, that, you know, is it maybe if I just talked to him, he would he'd understand and he'd change. And you know what I have to tell them time and time again is he doesn't care. He doesn't care about you and your son or your daughter that was murdered. He doesn't care about the fact that you want to get justice. He doesn't care about the fact that gangs are running rampant. Um he seems to have this one idea that is completely without any real backing um, that he just stays true to, and um, he's not willing to listen to people who um, bring him other points of view. Uh, but it's really the victims who live in you know communities of color um, and their families that are the ones that are impacted, that are really hurting because of his policies. And um, you know, I I, I hope that he has trouble sleeping at night because of that, because um, people's blood is on his hands. I mean, I want to hear from you, John. I, I became a DA because I, I wanted to solve problems in the community. And all the DAs I know, and the public defenders, by the way, they want to be problem solvers. They want to use the law and their skill set, their God-given skill set, to solve problems. Um, and whether it's in drug court, or domestic violence court, family justice center, whatever it is you're doing, working for victims, et cetera, you want to help reform and help people get a better way of life. I know that's driving you. I know that because we've talked a lot. Final thoughts. I mean, we, all of us as prosecutors, want to make our community a better and safer place for not only families, but for children, for all of us. And George Gascon is destroying our community here. And I can tell you, our community, my community, the community of color, is suffering the most as a result of George Gascon's policies. We all in our community want reforms. We do. But we never wanted them uh, at the expense of sacrificing public safety. All of us in our community want to have law and order, want to have public safety, want to have police officers who are responsible and responsive. We want to be um, protected. We want our children to be able to go outside, go to parks, go to the beach, go out and play, um, and feel that they're going to be safe. George Gascon lied to all of us. He did. He hasn't provided any reforms. And he definitely has, hasn't provided any public safety. And as Kathy has said, he's abandoned all of the victims and all of their families. And so we're really in a really serious situation here. So I thank you, Cully, for coming out here and talking about this. This is not a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. This is a human issue. It's a human rights issue, and hopefully, uh, uh, at some point, we can get this individual out, and so we can make our community better and safer. Well, on behalf of the Heritage Foundation and my colleagues, uh, and Zach, uh, my co-author, I want to thank each of you for your dedicated service to the city of Los Angeles and the county for your three decades' worth of service, and I wish you all the best of luck, and uh, we'll stand by for the next panel, which is the Victims Panel.